It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Kurtzi, who's going to talk about driving research to stop MS, restore function, and hopefully cure the disease. Tim. Thank you, Aaron, for that uh, kind introduction. I just wish my 16-year-old was here to hear all of it, because it was certainly more impressive than what I'll get when I get home tonight. I have my stone, so I'm going to cool it when I get, <coughs> excuse me, when I get home tonight. It is a pleasure to follow Millie, and also to join you here today. Um, I certainly appreciate the fact that you're here and not watching the uh, Giants uh, Buffalo Bills game, but you know I'll understand if some of you, if, of you leave for that. Um, I do want to spend a few minutes today sharing with you our vision for how we're going to create a world free of MS in partnership uh, with you. Um, the National MS Society was funded in 1945 by Sylvia Lari, not too far from here, who was determined to do something about helping her brother, Bernard. I think it's fitting that we're here today um, <clears throat> talking about what's changed about MS, even in the uh, 20 years that I've been in MS research since I uh, joined the, the MS research field. And so what I want to share with you is just some thoughts about what's changed and what is changing. Um, this picture obviously speaks to many of you who are here. Uh, it, I think, hits on what Aaron uh, referred to earlier about what has changed from 1993 to today. On the right, you see Rick, who was diagnosed in 1991 before the onset of any availability of any of the disease-modifying therapies, and he lives with a progressive form of MS. Susan, diagnosed in 1995, had a completely different set of options available to her. And what I hope to share with you is how we are pushing and driving research through the work of the National MS Society and the partnership with researchers around the world uh, and also people who participate in clinical trials around the world to really change the story about MS so that now that we have seven disease-modifying therapies, two symptomatic therapies approved for MS, what will the world be like in five years when we have hopefully yet more therapies for treating relapsing remitting MS and hopefully within the next few years after that treating progressive forms of MS? There's a lot to be excited about, and I want to spend some time sharing that with you. So I'm, I'm not going to belabor this point. You know MS um, is a challenging the disease. I, I want to draw your attention to that one number at the bottom. By our best estimates, the annual economic cost of MS in the, in the United States is $28 billion a year. That's a big number. It's a huge number. Um, why I share that number with you is not so much to um, reference the fact that it's expensive. I think everyone in this room would go a collective duh, you think. Um, I know the therapies are expensive. I, I, I really share that more to speak to the fact that when we talk about treating MS, it's not just the impact on the individual, but the family, the caregivers. There are so many impacts that go beyond um, just treatment to, to helping of families. Uh, the, the economic cost is not just dollars and cents. It's people. It's quality of life. And our goal is to be holistic about this. It's not just to focus on research for the sake of research or therapies for the sake of therapies, but for treating the entire community, the MS community, together. And I can just imagine a day when that number maybe starts going down. Now, that would be healthcare savings we'd all want. So in launching this, I, I do think it's important to share some of where we've come. And I apologize for the smaller size response. My, my staff will tell you that I am I really don't like using things that are too small because it's hard for people to read. When, I'm, when I can't read it, it's, it's challenging. But I, I do want to draw your attention to the difference between 1940, when we were founded, right around there, and 2011, where we thought MS in 1940 was caused by blood clots or poor circulation, you know, it was treated with drugs to help circulation, the average lifespan after a diagnosis was 18 years. Fast forward to 2011. We have the autoimmune uh, perspective on it. We have treatments, available disease-modifying therapies, a near-normal um, lifespan. 
that's a lot of progress in a relatively short period of time for many neurological diseases. And a lot of that is because of investment and research that started and was funded by the society many years ago. And so this cartoon illustrates, and I'm going to spend a few minutes walking you through what I see as the map of MS so that we can set the stage for the research in the future. You probably saw some of these diagrams earlier. What I want to draw your attention to is the fact that in 2011, we can be this precise about MS. That we can precisely know that part of the, that some of the underlying dysfunction in MS comes from damage to the nervous system, damage to myelin, destruction of nerve cells, and that we know the players that are causing that disruption, at least the general you know, we have a really strong feeling about what are the immune cells that are involved. There may be some new players that come along. But we can say with a great degree of precision, these are the targets. This is what we should hit. And in, in addition to stopping the damage, we should think about ways to restore nerve cells, restore myelin, restore function. That's a pretty, pretty exciting place to be because as a researcher and as a card-carrying PhD, not an MD, um, I. You know, I look at this and say, there are opportunities here for the new transformative therapies that will bring us nervous system repair and protection, therapies that will stop the disease, and ultimately, with such great precision, you can begin to think about what's causing this and can you develop a way to stop it. That's pretty remarkable. And this picture, which I, this cartoon, which is, is a, a was borrowed or, or kindly, do, kindly donated by Dr. Jerry Walensky, one of um, Dr. Miller's and Loveland's colleagues, um, is a map. And I, I want to walk you through this. Not so much, again, you saw some of this earlier from the outstanding presentations. What I want you to take away from this is I just showed you an example of a cartoon of a nerve cell. This is the, the map and our understanding of MS. And so there's lots of different stages in terms of relapsing, remitting MS. We know that there's an inflammatory phase, we know that there's failure to repair, compensation. What, what maps like this, and I really call this a map, what maps like this tell us, again, is how do we begin to intervene in the treatment of MS so that physicians that you heard from earlier have the tools for treating at different stages of the disease. Today in 2011, we have so much understanding about MS that we can start to think that way. And it also allows us to do something, and the animation's a little slow, that, that the National MS Society, with your help and the help of uh, leaders like Dr. Lublin and, and Dr. Miller, were able to create a new set of diagnostic criteria for MS, the third generation of this diagnostic criteria that are significantly changing how quickly we can diagnose people with MS. We're proud to have been part of that. A lot of that comes from the research that we helped fund. We also know a lot more about progressive MS today than we even did 10 years ago. Now, this map is not as well defined. This map needs a lot more um, landmarks put in it so that we can understand what's different about progressive MS from relapsing and remitting MS, where do we need to intervene, what are the changes, what's the different biological pathways. All of this is the focus of research at the National MS Society over the next five years. Filling in this map, defining progressive MS, defining how we treat progressive MS is the future. So that as new therapies are approved for relapsing and remitting MS, we can, always all, we can start pointing to a future where there will be treatments for progressive forms of MS. I want to share with you in the rest of our time how we're going to achieve that. We at the National MS Society have a pretty simple vision. It started off with Sylvia Lowry. It's create a world free of MS. I like to say that we're not just creating a world free of MS. Within, within that chapter, within the story that we're writing to create a world free of MS, there are chapters. I like to think that we're in the chapter where we, re, we are rewriting what it means to treat MS. As you will hear later and as you heard earlier today from our uh, physicians, we're beginning to see MS being changed as a result of the disease-modifying therapies. And we aim to do that by mobilizing people, resources, um, to drive research and ultimately, ultimately lead a, to a cure. We live this, it's part of our core being, and I hope that when you le walk away today, that you'll, you'll be able to have a sense of the kinds of investment and commitment that we're making. Since uh, 1946, we've spent close to $725 million on research worldwide. The very first grant that the National MS Society made 
went to Columbia University and led to um, the discovery of what we call oligoclonal bands, which was uh, when some folks have a lumbar puncture, you look for oligoclonal bands. That, that, that work was a, a result of the National MS Society investing at Columbia. This year, we will, in 2011, which for the society just concluded, our fiscal year just ended, we invested close to $39 million in 325 projects worldwide. Um, that's a significant investment, and our goal over the next few years is to increase that so that by 2015, we're spending close to 60 to $70 million on research. At a time when everyone else is cutting back research investments, we're making a commitment to increase our research investments significantly. And a few years ago, about a year and a half ago actually, we started a strategic planning exercise. And so we asked the, research, the MS community, researchers, people living with MS, chapter leaders, volunteer leaders, industry stakeholders. We asked a lot of people, thousands of people participated in, in, in telling us what they wanted us to focus on. What we heard loud and clear, which has helped shape what our direction is going to be for the next uh, five years, is that people with MS wanted us to see investing more money in research. There was, a, there was appreciation for what we had invested, but they wanted to see more. People who live with progressed forms of the disease said, you know, it's great that, you know, we have new therapies for relapsing remitting MS. What about me? So we have an increased focus on progressive forms of MS. And lastly, more, more talent, more scientists and physicians dedicated to the field of MS. It's a pretty tall order we have. It's a pretty tall order we're launching into. But I'm, I hope by the time I'm done, you'll, you'll be excited by what, by what we're doing. And so we committed for the next five years and beyond to do more, to focus on three areas. And if you don't walk away, if you don't remember anything else you say, I don't have a stone, but if you, otherwise I have three stones. Um, if you don't, rem don't remember anything else, you can remember that the National MS Society's research programs is focused on stopping disease progression, restoring function, and ending, the, ending MS. Stop, restore, and end is a theme you'll see at the bottom of all my slides. It's a theme you'll see on the National MS Society from, from here on out. Stop, restore, and end are the, key, are, are the anchors to our, our research strategy. And as a result of that, we are committed and have committed to raising $250 million over the next five years dedicated to MS research. What that means is that we're going to go from spending $39 million in our just concluded uh, research uh, campaign of th you know, in 2011, spending $39 million, so that by 2015 we'll be spending over $60 million. That's a significant increase. As the, as the tagline says, the, the campaign goes by now or no opportunity wasted. I encourage all of you to visit our website. We have, a, we have an informational video where you can become a research champion. Just uh, watch a, sh a short video, fill out some questions. You get a lovely t-shirt, although not as lovely as the yellow ones I see around here, but it, it's a lovely t-shirt. Um, but we're encouraging each one of you, every single person in this room, can become a champion for research. And by visiting that, you'll see some of the resources and information for this campaign. We are excited by what we can accomplish. And our objective in this, campaign is we want to find the bright, brightest young people, brightest young minds, brightest young talents. We want to fund the most promising research out there. We want to be the connector, getting people, resources, ideas, and filling those gaps in MS research that exist out there. Um, one of the things about young people and, and why we were particularly focused on young talents is that most people who, are, who um, win the Nobel Prize win it for work they did when they're in their early 30s. It's aging a little. You know, the young, the young talents are the ones that are impertinent enough not to, uh, not to abide, you know, the, the, the established dogma. And once upon a time, I was young, Aaron was young, we were all younger. Um, we like to think that we're still innovative at our age. Um, but we are very focused on bringing in those young talents because they're going to be the future for MS. And ultimately, our focus, and I, this is a, just a simple slide, the takeaway that I'd like you to see is that we are focused on taking the discoveries that are happening in universities that we're investing all around the world and translating those into new treatments and a cure. That's what I spend most of my time thinking about is how do we take the 300 plus projects, how do we look at that science, fund that best science, and then ask, how do we drive it towards a cure?
towards a new treatment, towards a new diagnostic, towards a new procedure that helps a physician know whether or not that uh, an individual's brain is being repaired. That's what matters. That's really the only thing that matters. And over the next few minutes, I want to give you some examples of what we're doing. So when we think about research, what we're doing is thinking about how we can discover new ideas and then translate those into application. We, we fund young scientists who are, committed to a, who are committed to MS. So I was the beneficiary of an advanced postdoctoral fellowship from the National MS Society. When I came into MS, I actually am an accidental tourist. I went to work in a lab because I wanted to be a brain researcher. I'd never heard of multiple sclerosis. I learned about multiple sclerosis because the lab I worked in was funded by the MS Society, and my mentor said, well, if you're going to work in this lab, you better apply for a fellowship because you need a salary, so the National MS Society will be there. So I said, okay, you're the boss. And that's, I applied for the fellowship. I got introduced to the Eastern North Carolina chapter, which funded my fellowship, met my first person who had MS. And what that did was transform me from being somebody who was interested in brain research to understanding that what I was working on was relevant to people. Um, that's a story that you'll hear over and over and over again, that young scientists, none of whom had ever heard of MS, went to work in MS because of a fellowship from the society, or people who have parents, loved ones, sisters, siblings, decide to work in MS. We've even got some fellows who are funded by us that live with MS. Um, and, and these young talents are the future. We're also focusing, focusing on fast forward, through Fast Forward on drug development partnerships. And then lastly, one of the most important things the society does is bring scientists and convene people together. Bringing the, bringing the thought leaders who are thinking what, about what is the next generation of research that needs to happen. Without that, some of the emerging ideas don't, don't, uh, don't come to life. That's how we build collaborations to, to, to create our nervous system repair partnerships. Together, by convening and connecting these people, we shift the dialogue around MS. And so just to come back, our core strategies are stop, restore, and end. And I want to spend the next few minutes sharing some examples of what the society is doing in each of these areas. So when we think about stop, what we're really thinking about is what exactly that word means. What can we do to stop the immune system attack on the, on the brain? That can mean using funding advanced imaging technology to define what's going on in the brain, to figure out how, what's, what's being stopped, to understand uh, which are the immune molecules involved in launching attacks, as Dr. Krieger had that lovely slide that I want to steal now too. Um, you know, where, how, do, how do each of those immune cells uh, attack the brain? We're looking at finding new molecules that could, uh, and drug molecules that can stop the attack and ultimately also understanding the genetic basis of the disease. Understanding genetics, while not in and of itself the end, I don't believe, will help us understand what differentiates one person who perhaps responds not so greatly to a new therapy versus somebody else who's, who tolerates the therapy great, uh, w w with great ease. Or why s within two, a family you can have one person Two people diagnosed with MS, one of whom progresses slowly, one of whom progresses quickly. Genetics probably has something to do with each of those. And so we're making some investments, and I want to give you some examples that excite me. I was given a specific task by Aaron to, uh, to speak about what's exciting to me. And so uh, some of our recent investments, uh, one we just made in a Dr. Raj Kapoor, who is engaged in a clinical trial of an old drug called Dilantin or Phenytoin which is used for epilepsy. And what he's doing is he's studying whether or not that drug can prevent um, damage to the optic nerve during optic neuritis. It's a very straightforward repurposing of an old therapy for a, new, for a new purpose. Over the next few years, we'll learn whether or not that therapy could be useful, but we could see, if it's successful, a future application of that drug for people with MS. We're investing in Dr. Ellen Mowry, who is do, engaged in a clinical trial where she's adding vitamin D at different levels to people who are already taking Copaxone and asking the question, can vitamin D, when added to Copaxone, shift the immune activity in these people who are living with MS? That could possibly uh, be part of a future uh, add-on therapy for other, other uh, uh, of the MS therapies. 
We're also investing in, a, in another clinical trial of an antioxidant called lipoic acid to see whether or not it can protect the, the optic nerve from damage. Now, you notice we're focusing a bit on the optic nerve for a couple of reasons. One is we're, we're focusing there because that's where you can ask very precise questions and precisely measure whether or not the drug is having a beneficial effect. But that could be extended to the brain, uh, ultimately. Through Fast Forward, we're also investing in a small drug company uh, in New Jersey that's uh, developing a new treatment that prevents immune cells from entering uh, the nervous system and attacking the brain. So it would be a new immune-modulating type of strategy, an oral one, that would potentially be an alternative to some of the existing therapies. And then also through the STOP strategy, we heard a little bit about CCSVI. We're investing in understanding what's happening with CCSVI. Uh, Dr. Fox, Dr. Field, Dr. Walensky, are all engaged uh, in three, three projects where they're aiming to replicate the original CCSVI um, studies, standardizing the procedures, analyzing some of the anatomy of veins. In one of the studies, there are, there are actually people who live with MS who pass away who have donated their veins to be studied because that, that, that will give you a real picture as to what's going on anatomically. And they're expanding their analysis to look at all the forms of MS. And this may seem pretty mundane. Why are we just focusing on standardization? Standardization is actually really critical so that every single time this procedure is applied across different clinics, there are standards that everybody agrees to. This is important work that we hope to uh, report results on next year. So that's one part of our strategy. Um, through our restore uh, theme, we're looking at exactly what it means. How do we restore function in people who live with MS? And it goes beyond just nerve, nervous system repair treatments. Um, it, it can include nat finding natural molecules that can stimulate repair. But you'll note, I'm also putting in their rehab. Rehab and exercise and quality of life will significantly improve um, the, the quality of life for people who live with MS. And we're also invested in uh, complementary and alternative therapies. So some examples. Um, in, at the University of Chicago, we're investing in a clinical trial that's looking at an exercise strategy to improve gait and mobility. This is Dr. Rob Model, a young talent who is you know, an up-and-coming rehabilitation specialist. What he's doing is he's taking specific rehab strategies and testing them on people who live with MS. And why is that important? It's important because that means that if it's successful, other rehab centers can apply this technique and other people living with MS can have something to work that's not pharmacological, it's not a drug treatment, but I, I hear from people who live with MS, if I could have the upper body to transfer, that would be good. If I can have better gait and mobility, that would really change my life. On the other side of the spectrum, uh, Dr. David Rowich, somebody who works on cerebral palsy and other diseases, is studying the role of a specific genetic factor in improving myelination and nerve repair in MS. Dr. Rowich's group made a, a series of discoveries that have given us a clue as to what are some of the genetic switches that can turn natural nerve repair, uh, which we know exists, in the brain and make it possible so that we can regulate that through a drug treatment. It's very early stuff, but it's the kind of investment that you have to make if you're going to get those therapies in the future. In addition, Dr. Dave, Doug Feinstein, also at the University of Illinois at Chicago, has discovered that you can, there are specific areas of the brain that if you treat specifically those areas of the brain, you can, uh, you can prevent damage from happening in other, other regions of the brain. This is a mouse study, and you know, I have a good friend who likes to say that mice lie and monkeys exaggerate, and I, I appreciate that. Um, but the reality is we do have to do studies in, in mouse models. This will help us in terms of thinking about how do you develop a nerve repair strategy in people who live with MS. And then lastly, um, in this, in this uh, theme, uh, Fast Forward invested in a company called Cognosi, which is a, a company that works in Alzheimer's disease. So this is not an MS company. They work in Alzheimer's disease. But interestingly enough, some of the problems about nerve damage, clearing out you know, the debris, the junk that happens that accumulates in MS after the nervous system is damaged, also is true in Alzheimer's. And they're, they're taking their therapy, which was originally developed for Alzheimer's disease, which is, in essence acts like a street cleaner. And it clears out debris, making it possible for new myelin and new nerve cells to be laid down. They're testing their therapy. They've done it in animals. And we hope that soon they will take it to the next stage of, t of doing the safety, and safety testing required to get um, a, 
a, a treatment that will help clear the pathway for remyelination in people with MS. And lastly, when it comes to ending MS, um, we're focused in a couple of different ways. One is obviously on genetics. So genetics actually applies to both stop and end. So it helps us under stop in terms of helping us understand how you know, the, the disease works in different people, what causes one person to progress faster versus another. Genetics also helps us understand what makes a person susceptible to MS. And so if we could have a, if we could have a handle on that, we could then begin to identify who might be at risk. And so we're investing specific, heavily in genetic studies. We're also investing heavily in population studies. As we alluded to earlier, we need to understand what the role of vitamin D is in this. What's the role of sun exposure? What's the role of smoking? What's the, what's the difference between pediatric MS and adult MS? About 15,000 children live with MS, some of them diagnosed as early as six. That's a lot of, that, that, that's a large population of kids who live with this disease and trying to understand what's different about the kids versus adults can help us understand MS in general, but perhaps also help us understand how the disease evolves. And lastly, we continue to be in the hunt for those viruses that might cause the trigger of MS. And so a couple of examples, just to give you a flavor. Um, Dr. Patsopoulos is a young fellow. This is a, one of our young postdoctoral fellows. He's taking the data from, a, from eight different studies, analyzing the genetic data. This is a study I don't even know how, I, how one could do it. 17, 000, analyzing data from 17,000 patients, 30,000 controls to help us understand what's the variation that happens between people who have MS and who don't. And why is this, why am I excited by this? Five years ago, we couldn't have even conceived of doing this study. Ten years ago, it was truly impossible. But today, we have the technology tools where one person can look at the data from 17,000 people who live with MS, 30,000 people who aren't affected by MS. Can you imagine that? 37, you know, 47,000 data sets, 47,000 individual data points. You couldn't do that before. Now you can. And in addition, we're investing in, on the other side of the spectrum, um, viruses, virus hunting. Uh, now, Dr. Bill Lindsay uh, at uh, University of Texas in, in Houston is, is asking a very simple question. His question is, does the immune response of a person who lives with MS differ when, they're in fact, when they have been exposed to Epstein-Barr virus versus someone who isn't? And he's asking the question, what's different, what's distinct? And that's, it's pretty much a fishing expedition. He's out hunting, trying to understand what's different. And by doing that, by trying to under, understand what's different, we can then take the next stage. If he, he identifies one, two, or three things that are different, you then replicate that in more people who have with MS, and then you can take the next stage of thinking about, is there some sort of intervention that you can engage in, some early screening that could be possible. All of these, this is just one example. We have several others where folks have come to us with some new viruses which they think are involved in MS. And we say that we're investing in funding that. The point of this isn't so that we can go on a large, you know, um, aimless effort to identify potential viruses. The goal here is twofold. One is to understand, is there a viral trigger that combined with a person's genetics makes them susceptible to MS? And if there is, can one think about a cure strategy? It's a pretty big idea. I'm not sure you know, how long that will take us to get that, but that's what Sylvia Lari started our organization to do and what I'm committed to do. So just to wrap up, um, just to give you a sense for where we're headed, um, I hope you've had a sense that this is just a flavor. You know, when I was asked to you know, sort of come up with what I like the best, it was like, you know, which of my two kids do I love the most? Um, 300 projects is a lot to, lot to, um, to love. But what I can tell you is that today in 2011, our research investments are up. We're growing. We're spending more money on research. Progressive MS is our priority, number one priority. And we're putting more clinicians and scientists coming into MS. You've had some great examples this morning of young talents invested in by the society, including Dr. Miller, who had a fellowship from the society many years ago. Um, we, we through, through these investments in young scientists, we've, we've, we've trained over 700 people who now work in, in MS. We are committed to making a difference for Susan, for Rick, 
and for all the people affected by MS. And I do want to end with a thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for listening. Uh, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. I, I'm, I'm curious, I do this in an audience, I can only do this in audiences this large. Are there individuals here who have participated in a clinical trial? Thank you. And I'll tell you why I say thank you. Oftentimes when I give a research talk, you know, folks are very excited by what, the lab, what people are doing in the lab. But I also want to celebrate all of the thousands of people who participate in a clinical trial. You're involved in helping bring those therapies. Without people who participate in clinical trials, we wouldn't have the therapies we have today. So you're just as much a part of making the research happen, helping us find a way to stop and restore that disease. So thank you very much.